There's a big debate about who is God. In fact, if you ask 10 different people about God, you hear 10 different opinions. And it's not about whether you're right or I'm right or he's right or she's right. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. I think what is most pressing in today's uh, society is have you experienced God? And what's it like to experience Him? That's why in this series, Check Him Out, we're looking at three things. I would call it nothing, something, everything. Did you hear me? Nothing, something, everything. So it, it, I could tell you something that at first it looks like nothing, but really it is something that has everything to do with your future, with your happiness, with your stability, with who you are, with how you perceive the world and make a difference. We're going to talk about God. Instead of talking in a debate format, you're right, I'm right, I want you to check them out for yourself. Experience God. Check him out. This evening we're going to be blessed as Laura Wetterlin comes to give us music. She not only performs, but she also composes her music and she inspires young people. And so we want to welcome her as we come to be blessed this evening in the Check Him Out series as we get to know Jesus Christ better through all the through Jose and others that have come. Thank you again for being here and Laura, bless us with your music.
God is changing lives in Eugene Springfield area. Both Jeremy and Jennifer Jordan grew up in Christian homes with lots of opportunities to be involved in youth groups and mission trips and, and selling Christian literature and all of these experiences. And the devil knew that they could be powerful workers for God. So he looked for ways to peel them away from their upbringing and following the ways of God. Jeremy said that when he got out of the Christian high school and graduated, it wasn't too long before he got into the wrong kind of dating relationships, wrong circles of friends, and he was living a life completely different from his upbringing. The time came, though, where he wanted to find a life partner. So he did go to a Christian website for Christian Seventh-day Adventist singles. And he saw this beautiful young lady named Jennifer. And the more he learned about her, the more he said, she's too good for me. I've messed up my life. But somehow the relationship started to develop online. And it led to some visits. And it led to Jennifer coming from Spokane, where she was living at the time, down here to visit. And ultimately, to a 4th of July giant parade and on the stage, Jeremy was given permission to propose in front of everyone for Jennifer. And Jennifer said yes. They had the desire to have a happy home, but when you don't have Christ in the center of the home, it's hard to have it happy. So there were bumps and dings along the way for the last four years. But then they saw it was time to really surrender to the Lord. And they saw that Jose Rojas was going to have some meetings in Eugene Springfield. And Jeremy said to his folks, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. His mom said to herself, we've been praying for this for a long time. And then she said, we will help you go. Whenever we decide that we're going to do something for God, the devil will always try to derail us. In this case, it meant on Friday having a car repossessed. There went the transportation, but they said, in spite of that, we're going to get to those meetings. Incidentally, 10 years ago, Jeremy went to one of those giant Pathfinder camperies back in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And as a 15-year-old, he heard a speaker speak to the tens of thousands gathered that speaker's name was Jose Rojas. And he said, if he ever comes to Eugene Springfield, I'm going to ask him to baptize me. Isn't God incredible? And now, Jeremy, because you love Jesus with all of your heart, and you're determined to keep your eyes on Jesus and follow him for the rest of your days, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, Jennifer, because you too are determined to live for Jesus for the rest of your days, and you want him to be the center of your life and your home, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to a unique series. This is not your normal revival or evangelistic crusade. The world has changed around us, have you noticed? Sin today is very sophisticated. In fact, sin today doesn't even look like sin. And we're discovering around the planet that God is reaching out to people in very different ways. What we are doing is adapting tonight. We are broadcasting from the great city of Eugene, Oregon. Guess what? It rained today. I know that's shocking <laughs> that it should rain in Oregon. There's a reason why these mighty cascades are green. It rains. But keep in mind, many of our viewers tonight, whether you're watching at home on a TV or, or, or over the internet, there are countries tonight where the drought is so extreme that people are dying. 
So what a blessed place to be broadcasting from. And if you're joining us, we are here for one reason, to check them out. Now, I know what you're wondering, what does that mean? Well, see, I grew up in this little town of East LA. Uh, perhaps some of you have heard of this little village uh, of 21 million people. And when I was a kid growing up and stuff was happening on the streets, they'd say, come here, man, check it out. And if there was gang action, police activity, 20 police cars, lights flashing for two of my friends, come and check it out. They're getting arrested. And I remember just growing up with having to check everything out. Well, one day I heard about Jesus Christ. And now it, in this world today, there is a lot of debate about religion. And there, I think we need to move to a more a greater civility among ourselves for the Lord does love his children. And I, all I want to share this week is how you too can check him out for yourself. And, and you can make your own decision. This isn't anything about debating or to try to suggest that you're wrong. The power of God is that he knows how to speak for himself. My friend Jose Angel Fuentes had just graduated with a divinity degree. He went out, he was in a large university city, just like this one, with tens of thousands of students hanging off of trees and roofs and windows. And they didn't have laptops back then. You had to type, remember that? Some of you are old enough to remember. Even I, in college, had to type my papers. And, and you get to the bottom and you misspelled a word. And your professor says, start all over. And you had to do another fresh piece of paper. Today, students have word processors that correct their paper automatically. Don't you just want to hit someone? <laughs> hmm. My professors didn't even allow me to use whiteout. Remember that? You'd paint the little letter over and type the correct letter over. Those days are gone. My children go to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington to see a typewriter for themselves. <laughs> That's where I live in Washington, DC. And, and, and it's free. They don't charge. You might enjoy that. I discovered with uh, the, the testimony that my friend told me as he went into a park in this university city one thing about university cities is that you have such knowledge, such skill with scholarship, such pursuit of information that pretty soon information eclipses God. Suddenly, human reasoning is more important than a deity. And not that that's wrong, but that's just what happens. And he, when he went into the city after graduating with his divinity degree, he saw a, a, a stately gentleman with a little derby hat reading a newspaper, wearing a suit on a Sunday morning in the park. And he thought, I'll go and talk to him about God, not knowing that it was a recently retired scientist from the university, one of the renowned scholars of evolution in that part of the country. As he approached him, the man with the newspaper could tell, oh no, a religious fanatic is coming toward me. He's holding that black book that they all seem to carry. The Bible, the Torah, whichever you, what you want to call it, the, the holy writings. And as he, he, the, uh, Jose arrived, he says, hi, and he interrupted him. Don't tell me. You're going to tell me there's a God. Yes, I, I know he exists. How do you know God exists? You have only one book, I can tell you, of 80, 90, 100 books that show research that proves conclusively there is no God. And Jose stood there not remembering if he ever took a course on what to do in moments like this. <laughs> well, and the man realizing he'd stumped another kid said, have you ever talked to God? Oh, yes, sir, I pray. Not that exercise. You think you're talking to divinity, but your voice stops at the ceiling. Well, okay, has God ever talked to you? Oh, yes, through the Holy Scriptures, through, through nature. Ah, has he ever talked to you the way I'm talking to you? No, no. Then how can you say 
that there's a God, young man. <sighs> okay, I answered your questions, now you answer mine. Have you ever talked to a toothache? Young man, I'll have you no know, idea in logic. Answer my question. Have you ever talked to a toothache? Of course not. This is highly irregular. Whatever. If you were in my class, I would have failed you already. Okay, has a toothache ever talked to you? I answer. I had to answer your stuff. Of course, a toothache's never talked to me. Then how do you know a toothache exists? I experience it, young man. I experience it. That's how I know that the Lord God of Israel exists. I've experienced him. The scholar says, I've, I, I, I've never experienced him. God's people tell a special story because the people of the Lord have experienced him. That's not a debate. That's not a, a discussion. That's not, that, that is not a fight. That is a testimony. If you've experienced the Lord God of Israel, you've experienced something. Uh, how many moms do we have here? Uh, do you have kids? Oh, you won't admit it, huh? Okay. <laughs> All right, I have four of them and six grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. And Have you ever tried to talk to a single couple about what it's like to have children? Oh, it's wonderful. I know, I babysit my niece and nephew all the time. No, 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 that's, that's fun too. Not, not all the time, but, but when it's your child, it, well, I know I took that class, I got an A. No, 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 it's bigger than a class. It's, 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 how can you describe something to someone that is not understood until you, once you hold flesh of your flesh and blood of your blood? So this is what it's like to be a parent and not sleep for the next three years. <laughs> oh, I don't care. For this is my loss of sleep. This is my child. He, she will grow up soon enough. Isn't it true? Enjoy them while you have them because they grow up fast. I got tired of hearing that 20 something years ago. I wish I could still keep hearing it. Kids grow up like this and they are the experience of your life. Let's bow our heads and pray. O oh Lord, our God, speak to us. Your servants are listening. In his name, amen. I want to talk about reasoning. See, human reasoning is at the root of all of this. So since that is the case, we will now move into neurophysiology. Neurophysiology is the study of the brain and its tissue, and its function, and its neuroconnectivity, the electrical impulses that drive neurons throughout your, your system. You, you know what I'm talking about. Just say yes. Okay, so neurophysiology is a science. For women, it's just called women's intuition. Yeah. Sisters were born with this stuff. Guys, if we want to learn anything, have to ask questions, listen, and study a bunch of books. Because a, a mom can look at her kid, where have you been? Uh, I was how uh, uh, you're lying. See, and the dad will say it looked true to me. <laughs> see, a mom could see through her kids. That's neurophysiology. I could tell because I asked him a visual question, and he went for his creative cortex. His eyes went up into the left instead of up into the right. <laughs> mom knows he was lying. Did you know that if you ask a creative question, the eyes go up into the left? If you ask a, a, a visual question, the eyes goes up into the right? You can't cheat this thing because it's electrically wired to your brain. Now the CIA can train you on how to lie effectively, and how, and, but I will not give you those secrets because I don't possess them. <laughs> the frontal lobe right here, if you touch your forehead, now you don't have to, but those of you watching at home can. Those of you sitting in sanctuaries, touch your forehead. Right behind this part of your skull is the frontal lobe of the brain. You can actually live without it. There's a procedure called 
a lobotomy, the removal or the disconnection of the frontal lobe. This is the window to your soul. This is where human reasoning occurs. This is where ethical uh, uh, values occur. This is where right and wrong are determined. This is where logical or illogical happens. If I tell you the sky is green, your frontal lobe instantly kicks in and says, no, it's not, it's blue. But immediately you even think of options. But unless you're burning a certain thing that puts out green smoke, or then you discover that Pastor Rojas is colorblind. Oh, no wonder. Blue, green, it's all the same to those people. See, and so the frontal lobe is where your reasoning occurs. We're in a university city, and many of our viewers are university students, and, and listen carefully what I'm saying. As you are studying, you are learning to reason. Once you get into philosophy, once you get into Reinhold Niebuhr, into Plato and Socrates, and all of these incredible people who stretch the brain beyond limits. Are you aware that great physicists such as Albert Einstein, his brain was physically larger than the rest of us? No wonder. We will not discuss my grades, for my brain was never that size. But we all have brain tissue that even if we have to hotwire it in the garage, it works. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I had failing grades most of my life. I'm not proud of it, but you will discover during this series that I hide nothing. I believe in transparency. And uh, I did not get good grades. Once I got into college, I got D's and F's my first year, my second year I got D's and F's, my third year I got D's and F's. Finally I got my Dear Jose letter. <laughs> Dear Jose, tell us why you should be readmitted for you are no longer a student at this beep institution of higher learning. I didn't want to give away the name. I have many friends that still live there. I was kicked out when my counselor came to speak to me. He asked me a simple question, and I'm telling you the honest truth. This is not a joke. I'm telling you from my heart. He asked me, why are you getting bad grades? And I calmly answered, because I'm a Mexican. Mexicans always get lower grades. I was told that by my teachers. Oh, sweetheart, don't worry. Mexican children always get lower grades. Okay. <laughs> I believed her. Sure enough, we did. Students rise to your level of expectation. If you expect nothing, they achieve nothing. If you expect much, they may complain every step of the way, but they will rise to your level of expectation. So um, I finished at the college, and I did not have the credits to graduate. I, I didn't have credits to be a sophomore much less March. Uh, in, interestingly, I was still hired to the ministry. I became clergy anyway, hanging out with pastors, all of whom had college degrees. I had a high school diploma, which made me very lonely at meetings. Finally, I took a leave of absence and went back to college at the age of 26, and I got my first A. <laughs> I know, that's shocking. <laughs> I got an A in stained glass. <laughs> but then I got an A in pre-exilic prophets, then exilic and post-exilic prophets. And, I, and then I got an A in introduction to theology, then suddenly an A in Hebrew. Suddenly, I, brain tissue began to <laughs> fire up, there's smoke coming out my right ear. And, my mom was, said it looked more like my nose than my ear, but there was lots of smoke as my brain kicked on. You see, frontal lobe function is misunderstood. Your reasoning is right here. And, and if you lose your frontal lobe, something terrible is going to happen. Lobotomies used to be the treatment for depression only a hundred years ago. Because here's where you worry. Here's where you get depressed. Here's where chemical imbalances occur that affect the temporal lobes of the brain far backward. So now, of course, if you get a lobotomy, you're not going to be depressed anymore. It's not working anymore. A woman, a devout woman, before her lobotomy, filled out a questionnaire. If you went to a store and they gave you $20 extra in change, what would you do? Oh, I would tell them they made a mistake and returned the money. 
After her lobotomy, once her brain had healed from the surgery, she filled out the same questionnaire. If you go to a store and they give you 20 extra dollars in the change, what would you do? I would return to that store as often as possible. <laughs> you see, the, the frontal lobe is your reasoning. The frontal lobe is the filter. The frontal lobe is where right and wrong, ethical, unethical, values or no values, moral or not moral, it's all determined here. That's why when you smoke a cigarette, when you're tense, You see, carbon monoxide is going into my lungs. It's gotten into my bloodstream, and more carbon monoxide than oxygen is reaching my frontal lobe. Ah, I'm not as stressed as the alpha waves, my frontal lobe, go to beta waves. I'm actually stunting my frontal lobe, and I feel better. Or I got terrible news to tell you, but first I needed a drink. I need another one. I gotta go tell my mother that her child has died. Okay, and as, as the alcohol gets into your blood and it reaches your frontal lobe, you relax. Okay, okay, let's go upstairs. I'm gonna break the bad news to my mom. You see, you had to do something to ease your frontal lobe, to put it into park. You had to, to, what they call, compromise your frontal lobe so that you can do something now that was very difficult to do. A hypnotist is someone who can bypass your frontal lobe. I will not describe how they do it because I don't want you to try this at home. And so all of a sudden, alpha waves stop and it's only beta waves, the back part of your brain. And now you're, you're susceptible to what's called the power of suggestion. It could be 200 degrees in the room. Oh, it's freezing and you believe it. You may be sweating profusely, but you, you, your, your, your reasoning has been bypassed. A good hypnotist bypasses frontal lobe function, reasoning. So when God comes up, this is where the debate has always centered. How could people of reasoning and goodwill actually believe in a divinity? So the greatest question arises, my friends who are secular specialists, who have, uh, you know, have been working on their third and fourth doctorates, that's scary. Where did that kind of brain tissue come from? I'm only working on my second doctorate. I mean, these guys, I met a guy who had 16 earned doctorates. I said, dude, you need a life. Man, what's like, I study, I love to study, I could tell. You're the smartest man in the world. Maybe when I grow up, I can do what you do. But in the meantime, check him out. And he was like, that's fascinating. You see, frontal lobe reasoning is where it always ends. Human reasoning crashing with divinity. There is no room for God. In all cultures, all faiths are reporting the same challenge. Whether you're in an Islamic country where Islam is slipping in one way or another, or whether you're in the great state of Israel and many more people move away from faith and values and traditions and no longer look heavenward. When you, in the Christian traditions, when you, when you suddenly don't know what you believe and you start telling your friends, it's my parents' church, it's my grandma's church, it's not mine. See, reasoning kicks in. And because I read a book or some article in Time magazine, there must not be a God. But see, the question that arises is then, what is the greatest need of humanity? If you just bring it down to least common denominator, what is the greatest need of people? What do people need most? You know what a lot of people say? Money. If I just had 500 extra bucks a month, that would cover the electricity and the dog food. It's a huge dog. Thing eats more than my kids. More than the horse. Dog food. You see, money is not the greatest need. Even though the greatest economic crash occurred that far surpassed 1929, just recently in the United States of America. I don't know if you're aware that our nation did hit bankruptcy. 
That's why the only way out is to spend money to save these banks. If you don't save these banks, 70, 80 nations will go under and millions of people will starve. Now that's something to reason through. Whoa. We're not debating anymore, are we? But that's still not the greatest need of humankind. What is the greatest need of humankind? What is it? Well, some would say food. I've been to countries where people are still starving. Millions of people starve. Every year, I was, um, I was at a meeting at the White House one day. We were discussing hunger. And the Chamber of Commerce director was there, and he reported to us that every day in the United States of America, we throw away 900 tons of food. You know that little bit you didn't finish at Taco Bell? I, I, I'm full. I'll leave this half burrito here. If you add up all that extra food and the stuff the dog didn't finish out in the porch, it's 90. What? 900 tons. There are people dying on planet Earth. We're in economic duress as a nation. The whole world is waiting for the U.S. to recover. And we still throw away food. So some would say the greatest need of humanity is food. And I've worked on those teams. We've fed millions of people who are hungry. Yet we discovered that is not the greatest need, least common denominator in humanity on planet Earth. And as you dig further, you finally find it. You know what the greatest issue on planet Earth is among humans? You learn it from counselors and therapists. It is the issue of guilt. The justice system is the issue of guilt. At your house, oh, it's the issue of guilt. You have what's called a dysfunctional family. I know your family's perfect, but just try to imagine a dysfunctional family. A dysfunctional family where dad barks a lot and mom is the appeaser, or vice versa, mom barks a lot and dad's the appeaser. And the kids gravitate to the other one because that's the codependent. And mom, why is dad always mad? Shh, he's in the next room. Wait, wait for him to go to work. Then we'll talk about it. So you grow up resentful with your father. And you remember that one time that he beat you. And you didn't report him either. Now that you can do those things. Now you're 27 years old and you have your child. And you feel guilty for having resented your father. You never resolved it. You still feel terrible that you really, truly hate his guts. Even though you love your dad to pieces, you hate everything. He ever, and he never apologizes. And, he never, and he still treats mom really bad. Tell the kids to be quiet. No, I don't want to go to church. No. Guilt. There are people who accept God only because of guilt. I need something. I can't handle my conscience. See, guilt is what drives most crime. Guilt is what drives dysfunction in a family. Guilt is what we inflict on our children from the earliest age. Now you see, Jesus is very sad every time you're a bad girl. Don't ever tell that to a child. That's a lie. That's not even biblical. Where do we get such an idea? That's a very depressed Jesus, because it's millions of kids at a time. He must be really desperately sad. That is not what's in the scriptures. We inflict guilt upon our children at the earliest age. From ancient times, we were taught that the God of Israel is a loving God, a merciful God and a just God. And the people were raised to love God, that they may know that I am their God and they are my people, that they may know, not wonder or guess. You see, guilt is not from God. Guilt is part of darkness because guilt is what drives you not to reason anymore. You're not doing things for the right reason. That's what hypocrisy is. Someone once suggested that hypocrisy is what, 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 what do most people think hypocrisy is? 
when you say one thing and you do another. That's not what hypocrisy is, because that means we're all hypocrites. Get in line. Take one and pass it down. I'm a hypocrite, pass it down. I'm a hypocrite, pass it down. I'm a hypocrite, pass it down. You see, if that's the definition of hypocrite, that you, what you, you say one thing and do another, don't we all make that mistake? Let me tell you what a real hypocrite is. Someone who does the right thing for the wrong reasons. Did you hear me? A hypocrite is someone who does the right thing, who does truth, but for the wrong reasons. Yep, of course I love God. Get out of my face. Amen. There are people that way. There was a book that was written, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And they would preach this stuff. And we're all going to burn in hellfire. And the audience would say, no, please. You too, don't you cry. You will feel the flames licking your flesh. That doesn't sound good to me. Now, who wants to give their life to the Lord? <laughs> yeah, I do, please. Don't kill me. When you do the right thing for the wrong reason. You see, we can be hypocritical even as preachers. There's power in the simplicity of God's Word. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet writes these words as he received them from the Lord. God says to Isaiah, as he's speaking to all of Israel, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let us frontal lobe this thing together. Uh, put your emotions aside. I want you to think with me, Israel. Think carefully. Reason with me. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, the power of God is that He wants to reason with us the greatest need of humanity. If you have guilt, I will forgive you. King David, a man after God's own heart, sinned with his neighbor woman. She was pregnant with his child, had her husband brought back from the front lines of battle. He refused to go home. How can I go home to my wife when my friends are dying on the field of battle? I cannot. I'm not worthy. That's how just a man he was. And David panicked and he gave him a note. Give this to the general when you return to the front. And when this poor innocent man returned to the front, the general read the letter from the king. Put this man at the front lines so that he will die. And that day an innocent man died and the prophet came to see King David. And he said, O oh, king, a man had many sheep and he had a neighbor with a single sheep and he decided to have a feast for his friends. And what he did was he killed his neighbor man, took his only sheep and killed it and had a feast for his friends. And David became upset. That's a terrible man. He should pay four times for what he has done. And Nathan the prophet, the man of God, said, O king, you are that man, O king, for you took your neighbor's wife and you had him killed. One of the most eloquent prayers in the scriptures is King David's prayer in Psalm 51. Against thee and thee alone, O Lord, have I sinned. My bones are broken before me. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and I will teach sinners your ways, and sinners will come back to thee. He was broken, and in his need, in his guilt, who gave him forgiveness? God. That can only be experienced when you seek God. You see how we're going beyond debate. 
There's something about experience. I cannot describe to you with this tongue unless you yourself experience it. It goes beyond the debate. There is a God in Israel. Experience Him. Don't argue about it. Check Him out for yourself. Whoa. LAPD used to worry about that. Now it's the darkness. I have seen him. Have you? It's not just I have studied him. It is possible to know everything about God without ever meeting him. It's kind of like the president of the United States. You know everything about him. Where he was born, well, unless you subscribe to his birth certificate isn't valid. Who his parents are or weren't where he went to school and what his views are. You subscribe or you don't subscribe to his views. You, 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 see, you open a newspaper, he's there. Turn on your internet, he's there. Go to the bathroom, he's on the wall. Everybody thinks they know the President of the United States, but do they really know him? No. Not until you shake someone's hand, fellowship with them and spend time. You know, I, I've met three presidents and worked with them and I, I've discovered something. These guys are just human. There is no great person, folks. Only God is great. And He can live right here. These people are just human. They need help like everybody else. And there are people who know everything about God, but they have not met. Oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. And they take the Word. They take the Holy Scriptures and use them as a club instead of as that healing medicine for guilt. I was in South Africa holding meetings with different tribes, the Zulu, and then I met with the white people. There's still tensions, a lot of memories of what happened not long ago during the years of apartheid. I tur it turns out that I'm a colored. <laughs> you have the blacks, you have the whites, and the colored. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I always knew there was a hue of color on me. I was in the oven for about 40 minutes. Others of you are still raw. Go back into the oven. We look like Him. We were made in His image. Look at us. Isn't God beautiful? Yes. I imagine a world made new. We're told it's going to be a perfect world. I'm sure everyone's going to have a mustache. Everyone is. <laughs> Ladies, prepare. Yeah. That didn't go over right. Don't worry. It's... That's Rojasian theory. It, it don't need, that doesn't even fit in. Um, don't let it pass through your frontal lobe because I know it was savagely blocked right now as I stated it. Don't worry. You see, in South Africa, my, my host used to be a commando, a special forces, a, a white soldier. Then he became a police officer. And he told me as we went into Soweto, the largest ghetto I've ever been in my life. It goes on for hours in all directions. There were protests and, 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 and kids would throw rocks. There was a woman. She and her husband had a 16-year-old son and he participated in the protests against the white government. And they would throw rocks at the jeeps as the police went by. And then they would get out and often there was killings. One day their young boy came running into the house. The mother said, where have you been? And very quickly, police officers arrived, and to her horror, she and her husband witnessed their son taken out to the front yard, and he summarily executed with a shot to the head. To their horror, they watched the police officers douse the body of their teenager and light it aflame. They had to stand there and watch the cremation of their child. Then the soldiers took up the ashes and pieces of bone and they said, where are you taking him that we may bury him, please? They were not to ask. He was removed. They never saw him again. Two years later, in the middle of the night, as they slept, soldiers broke in the door, flashlights in the middle of the night in the room, and they grabbed her husband and took him into the darkness and disappeared. And she never saw her husband Again, she found out later that he had been executed. His body was burned. But in that night moment in her room, as the flashlights move about, she saw the face of the commander of those cops. It was the same commander who had ordered the execution of her boy. And so 
Now apartheid had fallen and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was set up and now the government in nationally televised trials were placing people who had committed atrocities to face their victims in open court and they can now tell the truth and there was an opportunity for reconciliation. This commandant sat there sweating and pale as this woman was sat on the witness stand. Before a national audience, they, 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 they asked her, is this the commandant? Yes. He ordered the, the shooting of my boy and the burning of his body. They took his ashes and he took my husband in the middle of the night and I never saw him again. And I understand he ordered his death as well. That's the man. And the judge turned to the commandant, do you admit to this? This pale, sweating man. Yes, yes, it, 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 it was me. A nation watched as the judge turns to this woman and says, what should be done to this man for what he did to your family? The lady looked and this commandant's face and said, I'm a Christian. I love God. Therefore, I love you. Now what you did was wrong, she tells him. You took the most precious men of my life. You killed them. So I have only three things to ask of you. Number one, I forgive you. In the court, as everyone <gasps> catches their breath. Number two, I want you to take me to where you took their bones so that I can give them decent funeral services and have a place to pray and put flowers. I, I can take you, I know where, I, I can take you, all right. And then number three, she said, I want to learn to love you as my brother. I want you to come to my house since I have no one left. Come to my house that I may learn to love you. The judge burst into tears. The tears spread across the crowd and the entire nation paused to cry as this gallant woman who had lost it all looked upon the killer of her son and husband and said, I want you to come to my house that I might learn to love you. After a moment of, of tears and emotion, the judge dismissed the case. This commandant went to visit this woman, his victim, along with his wife and children. They took her home. And to this day, she lives in their home, not as their servant, but as a member of their family. The power of being released from guilt is the power of God. No one can forgive in and of themselves. It takes God's power in your life that you can forgive the unforgivable. Those who've experienced God's forgiveness know how to give it to someone else. Those who have not experienced God's forgiveness are terrible, vengeful people who forgive no one. My brother was murdered 20 years ago on the streets of Los Angeles. He begged for his life. He died anyway. His body was left behind a warehouse. Finally, the homeless complained he couldn't stay back there with the stench. And the, United, and the Los Angeles County coroner came and retrieved his remains and, and he was buried summarily in a grave. No prayer was offered. As clergy, I was not able to touch a casket and say goodbye. I, I wasn't able to pray for him and let him go. Two men killed him. One held him down while the other one took him out. Many witnesses in Los Angeles Police Department closed the case in three days for lack of evidence. 
I went to see the commander and I said, how can you do this? He says, too many of these people die every day. We have to close the cases. We can't keep up. I said, what you're saying, it was the wrong part of town in the wrong race. Had this been Beverly Hills, no stone would have been left unturned. And he says, unfortunately, yes. He apologized graciously and admitted to me that my brother was but a number in the homicide columns of Los Angeles County. I was going crazy with sadness. I have grieved for years the passing of a brother that I was not allowed to bury. I went to a mound of dirt that someone told me were his remains. I still don't know for sure, but everybody, the records seem to indicate that it's true. And since I haven't seen him again, he must be down there somewhere. I called my mother two years ago for Mother's Day. And I said, Mom, how are you doing? <laughs> Happy Mother's Day! You know, I'm fortunate I still have my mother and my father. I'm, I'm, no, I'm lucky. Not everyone does. I'm spoiled rotten. I still have my parents. They move slower. Their walkers are strong. But I have them. And I call them once a week, sometimes two or three or four or five times a week. It all depends on how it's going. <laughs> and you know, my mother interrupts me as I call her to wish her Happy Mother's Day. She says, Son, God has given me a gift! I know what I'm going to hear. You know, I'm thinking, God has given me my children. What a wonderful gift. She says, are you ready, son? Yes. God has given me a gift. I forgive the two men who took my boy from me. And I have the joy of the Lord in my heart. I invite you, son, to forgive them also. Experience, son, the power of God. You follow that's not a debate. That's a mother still shepherding her minister's son in the power of forgiveness. If she has experienced the forgiveness of God, she now has given it away to two men who will never apologize for their evil, who will never even repent. She forgives. My mother has found healing after losing her son. The power of forgiveness has released her. What is the greatest need for in humanity? It's guilt. The greatest solution is forgiveness. Come now, God told Israel, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. If your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now we Young people who are listening to me, your grandparents don't have a clue what I'm about to say, some, even some of your parents. But this gone wild culture that's going on, I know you're right in the middle of it. I know the pressures to, to be sexually active. I, I know you, that you're fighting infections and treatments. And, it, and there are a lot of secrets being kept for your family. It, you can't live with yourself. You see, there is a God in heaven. And He wants to restore you to personhood. Give your body back to the Lord, and He will bless your body. You see, you can experience this. Check Him out for yourself. This may sound like foolishness, and, and Paul wrote about it in the epistles. To the Greeks who were into knowledge and reasoning, it was utter foolishness, and, and to others it was a stumbling block. But to those who experience Him, He is the power of God unto salvation. Yeshua, Yeshua is the power of God. It may seem like foolishness, but it's a powerful, powerful experience. Seems I've imagined him all of my life as the wisest of all of mankind. But if God's holy wisdom is foolish to man, he must have seemed out of his mind. For even his family said he was mad the priest said the demons to blame God in the form of this strange young man could not have been perfectly sane we 
in our foolishness thought we were wise he played the fool and he opened our eyes when we in our weakness believed we were strong he became helpless to show we were wrong so we follow god's own fool and only the foolish can tell believe the unbelievable come be a fool as well So lay down your life for a carpenter's son, for a man there who died for a dream. And you'll have the faith his first followers had, and you'll feel the weight of the beat. So surrender the hunger to say, I must know, the courage to say, I believe. For the power of paradox opens our eyes and blinds those who say they can see. We in our foolishness thought we were wise. He played the fool and he opened our eyes. When we in our weakness believed we were strong, he became helpless to show we were wrong. So we and only the foolish can tell Believe the unbelievable Come be a fool as well Come be a fool as well Come each night, and we will look with reasoning at who is God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Simply demonstrating with testimony those who have experienced him. We want to go beyond the debate. We invite you to return. Some of you are watching us from Great Britain. In your great nation also, there's a lot of question about God. Some of you are watching from Australia, and you, you admit also that reasoning has surpassed divine intervention. God wants to bring you back to balance. He has a plan for your life. Check them out for yourself. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our Lord God, Thank you for your mercy in loving us and finding tangible ways of expressing yourself in our lives. Thank you for the Holy Scriptures that are a guide that point the way, but it's up to us to be willing to experience something. Teach us how to check him out for ourselves.